All right, so now we got to get the steam through the turbine and then back to the feed water system. So this main steam header runs down and splits off to two main steam stop valves. And those discharge to a common steam chest. And then there are four control valves coming off of that. Steam from the control valves goes into the turbine at the center, and then the HP turbine, high pressure turbine, has seven sets of blades. Seven stages. Each stage has a fixed set of blades and a rotating set of blades. So the rotating set of blades catches the, the steam as it's expanding and it's pushing, it's pushing on the blades. And it transfers that energy to, sh to the shaft, and then ultimately to the magnet at the end that's making electricity. And then the fixed blades redirect it, so they uh, they aim it so that it hits the next uh, set of blades right, instead of just getting the swirl going all the way through it, right? So they, they kind of curve counter to each other. All right, so. We go through seven stages of the HP turbine, and then we come out the bottom, and the exhaust from the HP turbine goes back into the boiler and gets heated up. And this is called the reheat section. So we call the, before it goes into the back of the boiler, it's called cold reheat. When it comes out of the boiler, it's called hot reheat. How hot is hot reheat? 1050. Same temperature, 1050. How cold is cold reheat? 680. Sure. 675, 680. I like those numbers. And then the pressure is like 650 on the cold and like 600 on the hot because as the it squeezes through these tubes the tubes resist it and you gotta you lose pressure as you go and because if you didn't then the steam would be stagnant and just sitting there it wouldn't be traveling it has to go from a higher pressure to a lower pressure so then we go to Intercept valve. From the intercept valve, we go into the IP turbine, the intermediate pressure turbine. We got five more sets of blades. So steam goes in, it expands, it gives up pressure, it loses pressure, it loses heat, gives turns that energy into the turn of the shaft. And then we exhaust out the intermediate pressure turbine and we go to the two low pressure turbines. And so here we are 700 degrees and 120 pounds. Why do we have to mess with this trip back to the reheat section? It's a lot of expensive piping. Why did we, why did we do that? Steam. I steam back up so it doesn't form water. Condense in the condense right. In it. right. So you're, the concern is that as the steam's giving up heat, the steam's giving up pressure. And if it's giving up heat faster than it's giving up pressure, you're worried about it condensing back into water. So if we hadn't, we wouldn't be 700 here if we hadn't heated it back up to 1,050. We'd be, I don't know, make up a number 300, right? 
and eventually before you got back to the condenser, you'd be down less than boiling and you'd get water, water droplets forming, which as previously discussed, is bad. All right. So, as the uh, steam expands, at, when you have less pressure on it, steam expands. That's what any gas does, right? And so, as it does that, you get more flow volume and more surface area. So, every set of blades has to get bigger than the one before it. And then, at this point, you, we went to this butterfly shape that has four sets of blades. Because if we didn't, if we just kept making them bigger and bigger and bigger, then at 3600 RPM, the outside ring gets bigger and bigger, which means faster and faster in terms of, you know, like actual miles per hour. And it, it wouldn't, it just wouldn't be able to do it. It'd just fly apart. So then we go across six sets of blades. Times four in your LP, LP turbine sections. And then that exhausts down into the condensers. Circ water through, flows through the condenser in a bunch of tubes. That cools the steam off, turns it back to water. That water goes to a condensate pump. That condensate pump goes to a feed pump. That feed pump goes back in the drum. Aren't we getting out the extractions from the extractions? All right. So an extraction is like a fancy word for a scoop, right? We are extracting steam out of the turbine after it's done work, after it's made megawatts and earned its keep and we're going to go use it for something else. And the something else is the feed, on the feed water heaters, we preheat the feed water, right? You've got a tube and shell, a U-tube and shell. So there's tubes that have the water in it and there's a steam on the outside. This is where we get the steam from. So we scoop off in a whole bunch of different places and they each have a motor operated valve and a check valve. And then that goes to heater seven. So the heaters are numbered where the lowest is the coolest, the first one you hit, and that they're numbered up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I'm talking about them kind of in the opposite direction because I'm going from higher pressure to lowest pressure. Highest energy steam to lowest energy steam. So heater seven, and then coming off of the coal reheat, we're going to heater six, and coming off of the IP turbine, we're going to heater five, and heater four. What's heater four known as? The aerator. The de aerator. That is correct. So all these others, I talked about that U-tube and shell, heater four is different, it is direct contact. The steam is mixing directly with the, the condensate. Uh, there's another difference on that guy, and that is you've got a double check valve arrangement. And that is because we talked about these check valves were to prevent on a unit trip to prevent the water in the heaters flashing the steam and going back going back up through these pipes and overspeeding your turbine. Well, the DA storage tank has so much water in it that they decided it needed two check valves. All right. And then we got three more heaters coming off the LP. Because these extractions have to stay balanced or else your uh, turbine's gonna vibrate. If you're pulling off one turbine, you gotta pull off 
the same section in all four LP sections. And that goes to heater three. These go to heater two. And they really are like that. They're, they don't come together. Heater three comes together for a single header. Heater two doesn't. It comes together for two, two headers going in. I don't know why it's that way, but it is. It is how it is. And then these last ones go to heater 1A and heater 1B. 1A and 1B don't have MOVs. They don't have an extraction. Because they sit in the condenser. Because they are physically inside the throat, inside the neck of the condenser. I think neck's more accurate than throat. <laughs> see. There are. Drain MOVs, air operated drains that are going to the condenser. And then there's before and after seat drains, which are way smaller for warming up the uh, main seam stop valves. There is drain on the coal reheat and drain on the hot reheat. All of those are open during startup. All of them shut at various points as you're raising the lever. The uh, intercept valve here, it's drawn like two valves, but there, if you look at it, it's only one valve body and built into it. There is a block valve and a control valve. And uh, as control room operator, I never saw this control valve do anything but stay full open all the time. I read that the control valve is for over speed protection. So in the event this guy hits 3606, RPM, then that control valve is supposed to start choking back and trying to protect it from overspeed. I thought 3601 was overspeed. Nah. <laughs> 3600 RPM is the 60 hertz set one, right? But you'll see 3601, 3602. That's, in hertz, that's point like 001 or something. It's not that big a deal. What, a certain percentage of your 3600? Your overspeed? Yeah, so overspeed protection, as in trip it, shut the main steam stop valve because we've got too much steam, uh, that number is like 4,800. Now, I don't remember. I'm sorry. It's high. It's like surprisingly high. But the only way you'll ever get there is if this magnet isn't stuck to the grid anymore, right? Because the grid has way more ass than our own turbine. Our 700 megawatts is a lot, but it's nothing compared to, you know, everything west of the Mississippi. couple of other things that we use coal reheat for. What do we use it for? Ox steam. What are the three sources of ox steam? Coal reheat. Ox boiler, which we hardly ever use. And primary. primary superheat. Motor 
operator guy. All right. What else do we use Core Reading for? Also taps off the secondary superheat. Sit long header. Okay. So soot blowing is not coming straight off ox steam. That's a myth you'll hear somebody misspeak around here sometimes. That's not how it works. It's got its own header. It comes off coal reheat in a different place. So. So why do we have two sources? Because we have two separate pressures and sources. Kind of related, not wrong. <laughs> All right, so the easy answer is reliability. We like to have extra things in a power plant because when things don't work, if we can keep running, then we keep making money, and that makes everybody happy. So. Reliability is one answer. Another answer, which I think is what you were heading towards, is all these numbers for pressures I gave out are full load numbers, right? But if we drop down to 300 megawatts, then we're not at 2,800 PSI, we're at like 1,600 PSI. And then here in the coal reheat, we're not 650 PSI, we're like 350 PSI. And that might not be enough pressure to provide 280 pounds to the sit blowing header. So when we drop load, then the sit blowing header can't be maintained by the coal reheat, even though that's the steam we'd rather use because it's lower pressure, so it's easier to control, because it's already gone through seven sets of turtle blades, so it's earned its keep, so it's more efficient, it's more equipment friendly, but it just can't freaking do it. Uh, similarly with aux steam, any load we see when we're in uh, AGC, automatic generator control, uh, we're gonna be on our normal source of aux steam. We're gonna be coming off over heat. But during startup, you don't have any pressure on this header at all until you sink the turbine, right? So you've got 10 hours where you're on steam fires here and we, to get our first ox steam off the secondary superheat well before we sink. You got uh, 350 pounds on the drum, you can line up ox steam off the secondary superheat, or primary superheat. All right, we talked about controlling 1,050 on the main steam header. How do we control 1,050 on the hot reheat header? Temperation on the cold reheat. All right, that is one answer. So coming off of the feed pump, got that. Got that wicked ass knocker valve, and you've got a check valve, and then you go up to the ninth floor, and then you have like a double control valve arrangement and in the coal reheat. Back pass dampers. So here you got sets of dampers that are controlling how much flue gas goes across the reheat side versus how much flue gas goes across the primary superheat side. So the reheat side is being controlled to that 1,050, and the primary superheat gets the rest of it. And at most times, most boiler conditions, the rest of it is actually most of it. 
but you got time to cool it down if it's too hot. Whereas the reheat, you don't really have too much time to cool it down. Well, you don't have too much more than that to go through to get there. All right. Uh, so these dampers for control are much slower than spraying water into the into the piping, right? So if a soot blower goes in on the reheat side, it cleans a bunch of crap off of it. Now it start that that ash was acting like insulation, right? So you clean it up, and now it starts absorbing a lot more heat, and this temperature jumps up. Well, these backpass dampers will fix it eventually, but the system might want to spray some water in there to control it faster. So soot blowers are designed to clean the stuff off the walls and off the pipes. And so you got a soot blower at 280 pounds, and it goes through a pop valve, and it gets command from BCS, and it's got nozzles that point two different ways. And as it goes in, it turns. And it's supposed to carve a path, a spiral, a double helix through the through the dirt. As a guy 22 feet in hits a limit switch. It's supposed to turn like an extra 90 degrees so that when it comes out, it carves a separate path and you get as much cleaning as you can out of the thing. Uh, the other way we clean, what's the other way we clean tubes? No, uh, well, air can? No, well, your, your water, water, water cannons. Water cannons. So air cannons are an ash blue gas thing. They do exist. Water cannons are for cleaning tubes. So, you got four of them. They got like a little swivel ball and they come off the surface water. And then they shoot water across the other side of the boiler. These are not like a pressure washer. What they're supposed to be doing is striking the ash on the tubes and they make a little pattern. And then when the ash, ash on the tubes cools off, it shrinks and falls off. Sometimes you can actually see in the bottom ash like little wedges that look just like tubes. I was that water <laughs> getting across that boiler at 1600 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> high pressure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean high pressure. It's 120 pounds. It's surface water. Well, no, because it gets stepped up from the up from, from surface water is 120 and then it's about, about 200, 210. I think it may be a little more, but it's somewhere right there around 200. All right, so surface <laughs> water on the suction side of the pump is 120, and then you go into the uh, water cannon pump. Thank you, sir. The water cannon pump. And then that gets it up, man, I want to say 400, but I don't actually remember it, that. It, it may be. And then that shoots it across the other side. So 400 pounds of pressure in a nice tight tube. It doesn't have that long of exposure. It doesn't have that much surface area. That's how it makes it across. I don't know, Terry. I don't know. <laughs> You're right, though. 1,600 degrees seems to be asking a lot of that, that stream of water. That's the draft, you think. All right. So how does it know what tubes to shoot? It doesn't. Oh, it does. Mm -hmm. It's a good. All right. <clears throat> All right. So we've got our tubes. going to title this video turbine and now I'm going back to the boiler so I don't know what I'm going to do. All right. All right. So we've got temperature monitoring that is on the outside of the tube and on the inside of the tube. And the temperature on the inside of the tube that's being cooled down by the water is going to be 680 degrees. And the temperature on the outside of the tube 
one side of this is the furnace. The other side is insulation and then, then air. So on the furnace side, you were looking at that 1600 degrees. Well, as ash builds up and acts as an insulator, then the temperature on this side is no longer 1600. It starts getting closer and closer to that 680. So the difference between the inside and outside temperature on the tube metal is called heat flux. And that is what tells it whether it's dirty or not. And there's something like 32 heat flux sensors throughout the boiler that tells it which sections need to be cleaned. Yeah. New stuff. Yeah. All this probes are just everywhere. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Little boxes that stick out. Yeah. That's what they're doing. Uh, we had a design issue early on where every single one of those fuckers had to be cut out and replaced because the water was hitting them and something was making the tubes fail right at those heat flux sensors. And we had a big, we, we, people more important than me had a big argument with the designers and, uh, you know, sued and I don't know if it actually came to legals or whether they paid for the, all of them to be cut out or replaced. <coughs> but it was, it was a deal. All right. So now we're going to talk about nucleate boiling versus film boiling. So as the walls of these tubes absorb heat, then that makes a little bubble of steam, and then that bubble of steam gets carried off, and then it may or may not collapse back into the water and heat up the water that's around it, right? And that's kind of how this heat transfer process happens. The, the bulk of it, the bulk of the water is getting heated up by these steam bubbles. They get formed and then flow back to the middle. And that's nucleate boiling. If your heat flux is too high, if you've got too much temperature in one spot, then you will get steam that builds up on the wall that does not drift off into the middle. And this causes like a film of steam and water conducts heat very, very well. And steam does not conduct heat very well. So we're here at the water, you're at a nice toasty 680. Here with the steam cooling instead of the water cooling it, it's with seven, eight, nine hundred degrees. And then there's nothing cool in this, you're, you're not cooling this pipe as much, and you're going to overheat it, and steel that gets too hot gets soft. That's why it's so important to keep water and flow through all these things all the time. So, a lot of plants protect against this by having a pump. They have a, a boiler circulation pump to make sure you have enough flow through the tubes all the time. Maintain a drum level is key. If the drum level comes uh, gets too low, then you won't have any flow through these tubes, and you'll you'll wreck your whole fucking boiler, and we'll all get a jobs. Does, does oxygen play a part in that too? Eh, not too really. Oxygen plays a part in how much corrosion you get, but not really in this heat transfer business. But you derailed me. Give me a second. All right. So, uh, so part of the reason our boiler is so tall is because the, the higher it is, then the more that difference in density makes a difference in pressure. If you've got hot water and cold water that's only two feet tall, then you don't get the same kind of pressure differential as you do versus 107 feet tall. Eh, does that make some kind of sense? Mm -hmm. So, uh, another factor they did to let us have this natural research is they, they rifled the tubes. So there's spirals cut into the inside. I say cut, they're actually kind of projecting in onto the inside of the tubes. Because that's what rifling is, it's a spiral. Did you know that? Did you, did you know there's a the rifle and shotgun? It made them redemption. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
So it creates more turbulence on the natural circulation flow, and that more turbulence means that the bubbles are less likely to be built up on the wall, and therefore we can, we can run. Last point I want to hit on is I want to kind of talk about load control and what drives what. So we're sitting at 700 megawatts and they ramp us up and we're going to 720 megawatts. So that means that the control valve is going to open up and that's going to let more steam through the turbine and that is going to mean that things push harder and the magnets spins a little more in advance and then that pushes more megawatts on the grid, right? When we open these valves up, it lets more steam through and that means this pressure starts going down. How do we get that pressure back up to set point? More coal. So the feeder speed, the coal feeders speed up, more fuel goes in, raises that pressure back up to set point. And similarly, when we're, if they're ramping down, these valves pinch off, that drives this pressure up, and then the feeders have to slow down, put less coal in to maintain the same pressure. So, somebody thought that we would be driving a, a base load unit, and that these valves would be 100% open, because if these valves are open all the way, then the seat is not blocking the steam at all, and you are more efficient. But And then, change in pressure changes megawatts directly. If, if the valves are out of the picture, they're 100% open, then a certain pressure is going to get you a certain megawatts. Yeah, but that would take like a, that would be a gradual, uh, it wouldn't be fine tuned. Would you are 100% correct. Uh, it turns out we can't afford to sell our megawatts at base load. Uh, they want us to be able to control megawatts and then we can sell our megawatts for more than we can if we just go to a flat, a flat amount. And I don't understand the market any better than to tell you that. But so, you, when these valves, it's more efficient, but it's not economical. Economical, they want us to be able to control a set point tighter, and so the control valves have to do a thing. When we do our efficiency test, we put these control valves in manual and open them up all the way. And then we dial in a set pressure, and we just leave it there for six hours. It's a four hour test, but there's an hour stabilization at the uh, beginning and then they pick the best four out of the five hours of actual testing we do. And then we do it again the next day. And then they use those numbers to calculate our efficiency and calculate our availability. And we were a 665 megawatt unit. And now we're a 680 megawatt unit because these tests keep coming in higher especially the damn winter tests. We're more efficient in the winter than we are in the summer. Wow. And so because of that, they, they see these numbers and they're like, they don't want to look at the, the weather adjustment because the engineers actually do like a, you know, they say, oh, well, ambient temperature was this and that made us more efficient. And so the real number isn't really 687. It's really 679. I'm like, but look at that 687. Why can't we sell that? That 687 is probably exaggerated, and I haven't actually looked at these numbers that close. But that that's how we end up promising more and more availability. Which, you know, is good. It's more money for the owners. It's more stress on the unit, but it's probably okay. And I think that's it. It's a lot. Any questions?